title of today's presentation, Making Money with Sublimation. So let's start off with a very simple question in a blank picture. What is this worth? You know, it's air. It's worth a lot when you can't breathe, right? But here's what we're talking about. What you see here on the screen is uh, a blank iPhone cover, okay? Now, that one's designed to be sublimated. But right now, it's blank, and what's it worth? You know, I mean, to, to your client just looking at a boring white one, it's probably not worth a whole lot of money, right? But when we do something like this and put something on it, suddenly it has a lot of value. And this is important to understand because putting that image on there, completely changed the perception of what the product is. And the value of a product is based on the perception of worth of that particular product. Um, so when we go to sublimate something, we're adding value to it. That's what we're talking about. We're taking a blank, we're adding value to it, and we can be adding a lot, especially when we do something like personalization. You know, this has been personalized to the Hendrix family. That's worth a lot of money, okay, that particular picture. You and me, it's worth money if we're collecting it because we don't know who the you know, young Mr. Hendrix is, right? But you get my picture, okay? Uh, so if we actually start looking at, you know, what are the true numbers that go with that, okay? Well, in this particular example, the iPhone cover I'm referencing is $3.25. I'm not going to tell you that that's a JDS price. That's just a, a number that I'm using here for reference. Uh, our image cost is almost insignificant on here, you know, maybe 13 cents there. Um, labor and overhead, I put in two bucks. It came out to $5.38, okay, $5.38. Now, I run into a lot of people that use this age-old formula that goes something like uh, cost of the blank plus the cost of labor plus the cost of materials times two. If you're doing the times two, you're probably shooting yourself in the foot on a lot of the stuff that you're doing because this has a far higher value to the audience of the family than a times two type of product. Um, we've done some surveys and we've seen retail consumer pricing of $25 to $35 for personalized phone covers. Now, there's a lot of variables as to what the prices are we're getting, and we always have people out there who love to give stuff away. But really, when you go out into the true retail world, we're seeing people getting stuff from $25 to $35 for this type of product. In fact, I was in Walmart recently, and on the wall in Walmart, they had a personalized iPhone cover that you could order for $28.95. So if Walmart's selling it for $28.95, <clears throat> you should be selling it for higher because Walmart sets the bar on low price. And since everyone assumes they have the lowest price, your price being higher would be perfectly normal. So whether you're charging 25 or 35 or 28.95, okay? The point being is if it costs $5.38 to make, you can make some pretty decent money. Even if you're selling it to someone else who's going to in turn resell it, that means you're selling it at a fulfillment price or a wholesale price, okay? You can still make a pretty decent margin off this thing. So this is what you want to keep. Everything you want to think about for making money with sublimation comes down to perception of value on the part of the customer. Okay, That's what drives your margins. That's what drives your profits. So everything you have to do needs to be focused on that concept, driving up perceived value. Okay, What you do, what you say, all those things go into it. Because the reality is it's only worth what someone will pay for it. Okay? It's as simple as that. It's only worth what someone will pay for it. It's not about a formula. It's worth what someone will pay for it. Um, and you have to constantly work to elevate your product to the highest possible level. I mean, you make a whole lot more money by getting a bigger margin than by doing more pieces. Okay, Let's think about it. Um, if you're making a dollar a piece and, and you sell 20 of them, you made 20 bucks. And this scenario I just showed you, you sold one, you made 20 bucks. Which one would you rather do? Okay, I know it's never always that easy, but whatever. Okay, So the big question becomes, what are you selling? See, most people are not born sales reps, Okay, and they, and they don't always understand how to sell what they're doing. Okay, And because of that, if you don't come across effectively with a customer, you may be devaluing your product because you, you just didn't know how to sell it. So it's a major question. What are you selling? And please don't say sublimation. And don't say decorated products, okay? And don't even sell, say customer service. Good answer, but don't say customer service, okay? You're going to understand what I'm talking about here in just a minute, okay? Now here's some points to consider as we go towards answering that question. First of all, your customers don't really care about the process, only the end result. Okay, keep that in mind when you're talking to somebody because a lot of times you get wrapped up in, well, this is how we do sublimation and this is the process and it's molecular and psh, all that stuff, right? Yeah, don't worry about it. Um, Talk to your customer about the end result of you creating something that fulfills a need that they have. Okay, 
keep in mind your customers have no imagination that no imagination and very little vision. You know, a lot of times they come to you with the most boring things you can possibly imagine. They want you to reproduce, and the reality is no one's really excited when you're done. And you're going with that age-old theory of the customer's always right. Let me tell you what, when it comes to vision, a lot of them are wrong. They just don't get it. You know, you got a lot of boring people. You know, they want to put white block letters on something black or vice versa. You know what, if you can spice it up, make it more interesting, you're going to raise the perceived value. You're going to make more money. Simple as that. And finally, your customers have needs and don't even know it. So you've got to be constantly putting ideas and concepts in front of them of things you can do for them. You've got to be the driver. You've got to be thinking it through as you go. That's what I'm talking about. Okay? So let's go back to that question. What are you selling? We're going to do some testing here. Okay? So first test, what is this? Well, if you look at the screen, you see some mouse pads. So if you say, hey, Jimmy, those are mouse pads, I'll say, you know what? You are correct. And if you say, hey, Jimmy, those are sublimated mouse pads, I would say, you're still correct. And then I'd say you're wrong, because what this really is is advertising. And see, that's important. If you go to your customer and say, hey, I want to sell you some sublimated mouse pads, they're like, not really excited. Okay. If you go to your customer and say, listen, I'm going to show you a really creative way to get people in the door through advertising that works. Okay. Or something along those lines. I mean, that's the whole point is trying to help them with that. Now, there's a whole industry that gears itself to advertising with products like that. And it's called the promotional products industry. Uh, there's actually a, a trade organization, PPAI, Promotional Products Association. There's another one that is the Ad Specialty uh, or Advertising Specialty Institute. Okay, so I mean, it, that's that's a whole industry. But the reality is businesses buy things all the time and then add their image to it, whether it's their brand or their logo or their slogan or something, and then they try to give those out to people, and hopefully people will use those things so that they are inclined to come back and do business with that company. Okay, That's what advertising is really all about. Okay, And you can do a lot of that, and that's your idea. Show people how to reach out to their clients and new clients, you know. And, you know, one of the most common things you see in the promotional products world is an ink pen. Yeah, everybody uses an ink pen. Really? Look at the ink pen that's in your hand next time you're using it, and you'll notice you probably don't see the brand, okay? And what happens when the ink pen runs out or doesn't work, you throw it away? How many times have you actually looked at the pen and said, hey, I think I'll go buy something from this company, you know? So there's a lot of things that people are giving out all the time that just really aren't effective, but they think it is. Okay, let me give you an example. Um, before I even got into this business, okay, um, I was into competitive water skiing and saved up my money and bought a tournament grade ski boat. I know I'm boring you already if you don't like skiing, okay, but a lot of those people over at JDS do. I know this, okay. So anyway, so I saved up, bought this boat, which has a certain demographic of who buys that boat, and you know, and it's an expensive boat. I mean, not just the average guy buys it. It's a certain type of person fits into a demographic somewhat that buys the boat. So I saved up my money, bought this boat, went to pick the boat up, and the owner of the marina came out, and he gave me a navy blue foam front mesh back hat with the name of the marina in white block letters on the front. It was pathetic. I wouldn't be caught dead wearing that hat. I was actually offended. I bought a Rolls Royce of boats, and you gave me a plastic keychain. I mean, that's kind of what it was equivalent to. So did I wear the hat? No, I threw it away. I wouldn't be caught dead in the hat. So he spent money to buy that hat to give to people like me, thinking I'm going to wear it so people see it and he gets promotion. No, he got nothing. Okay? So I threw it away. Well, let's fast forward. Okay? Several years later, I get into the business. And by the way, I started as an embroiderer. So if we have any embroiderers out there, I speak your language. Okay? I started as an embroiderer before I kind of rolled into the digital and printing and all that. So I went back to the owner of the marina and decided to pitch him on buying a better quality hat. You know? So I went in and said, hey, Carl, remember when I bought my first boat here? You know, that hat that you gave me is like, oh, yeah, yeah, that, those are great. We still do that today, man, our best form of advertising. You know, we get them for a dollar a piece, something and no kidding, right? We get them like for a dollar a piece, and we get about like 500 a year because you give a guy a hat, the guy's going to wear the hat, people are going to see it, da, da 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 right? And I said, well, you know, Carl was a little bit offended. And he's like, really? I'm offended. I'm sorry about that. And I was like, no, no, no. You know, I, but I... It, I'm not complaining, but I was offended. I mean, I wouldn't be caught dead wearing that hat. No offense. I mean, I threw it away. Well, sorry you feel that way. And I said, Carl, have you actually ever seen anybody wear one? And he's like, well, you know, my mechanics do. I said, no, no, no. Have you actually seen one outside of your building actually wear one? He thought for a long time. He really couldn't answer it, but he didn't want to answer no. But, you know, he's still not getting it. And then he launched into, he did this over and over again. 
but I get a great deal. I pay a dollar each. I buy five hundred a year. It's my you know foremost form of advertising. And I'm like, but what kind of return are you getting on that? And I said, um, you know, let me get to another way. Why don't you just write me a check for five hundred dollars, and I'll leave, not bother you anymore. And he's like, well, why would I do that? Because I'm not getting anything for my money. I said, precisely. You're not getting anything for your money right now. You're writing somebody a five hundred dollar check. He's giving you a, you know a caseload of hats, and you're giving them out, and they're going in the trash. I said, you know, it's just it's not effective. His wife's in the background shaking her head up and down as fast as she can go, saying, you know, you know, I told you I have that those hats. You need to do something better. And he's like, oh, I get them really cheap. He was so focused on cheap. That was my point. So I said to him, I said, listen, I will tell you what, the type of people that buy your boats, okay, are like me, and we like low profile wash khaki caps with embroidery. Now, if you buy that. And you, you know, give that to me. I'm going to wear it. I would have worn it if you given me that. You didn't do it, you know. And he's like, "Well, that costs more." I said, "Certainly, it costs more." I said, "But it, the point is, you're reaching people." You know, I said, "I tell you what. How many boats do you sell per year?" He said, "About a hundred." And I said, and, "You know, we're talking about there's a big margin in these boats. The guy sells a hundred boats a year and gives away a dollar hat. I mean, come on." Okay. Anyway, so I said, "Well, why don't you just buy a hundred hats and give one out to everybody that buys a boat? Makes it a little bit more special, you know." And he's like, "Oh no, it's going to cost more money." I said, "I'll tell you what. I'll do a hundred of them for five hundred bucks." And he's like, "That's five dollars a half." Yeah, no. And he's like, "I don't know," but it's, you know, his wife said, "Do it." So he ordered them grudgingly, and I delivered. About two weeks later, he calls up and says, "Hey, you know what? I got a problem with the hats." I was like, "Uh uh, what?" And he's like, "People want to buy them." That was a bombshell, man. People want to buy them. They saw them in his accessories area and they wanted to buy them and this you know is important because number one he bought a lot more hats okay and at that point too I said well why don't we upgrade things okay why don't we see if we can get the Nautiques logos and see the ski Nautique dealer on there and then the name of the marina and really put this together right and you'll probably sell a ton of them but it also set off a light bulb in my head that I never forgot that I started putting in my sales approaches and that was to be able to go to a client and say how would you like it if I could show you a way to have your customer pay you to advertise for you? It's huge. Can't do that with every customer and every product, but for the right ones, yeah, you can do that. Okay. Here's a great example of that. You know, how many people have ever heard of Hard Rock? Or excuse me, how many people have never heard of Hard Rock? Okay. Point being is they don't do any advertising except for products. Okay. And yet they have a tremendous clientele, products. And they don't give those things away. Okay. Those things are expensive. And people buy them, and they're making money on it all day long. So that became the type of approach I start using with the right businesses. I do a lot with the tourist trade, and in the tourist business, that's an easy pitch. You know, how would you like to show you, you know, way to have your customer pay you to advertise for you? Because you put together something. That's what they're in the tourist trade. Look at this shirt: Hard Rock Cafe Orlando. Okay, guy bought it. Bought it because it says Orlando, not because it said Hard Rock. Yeah, but they're getting all the promotion out of it. So, what kind of creative ways can you come up with your customer? to be able to put these ideas in front of them instead of saying, well, would you like a shirt with sublimation? Okay? That's not going to take you very far. Now, what is this? Okay, new product up there. It's a coffee mug. Yes, it's a sublimated coffee mug. You could say it's advertising and you would be technically correct to say I love New York. But we actually call this a souvenir. And see this is important because I'm I'm starting to differentiate things with words. And when I differentiate them, we have different angles. Our advertising is one angle. A souvenir market is a totally different angle. Okay, why do people buy souvenirs? Because they want to advertise from New York or somewhere? No, they buy souvenirs to say, "Been there, done that." Okay, so that's a special thing for most people. Souvenir trade is absolutely huge, and the key in the souvenir business is that you get what we call a name drop on there. Okay, in the name of the place, and you can see four of the five products say something, though they may be hard to read on your screen. We got New York, we got Ohio. It says Margaritaville, and this is Key West. Uh, this is now. Nah, see, I can't even read that one, but it's a zoo. <laughs> okay, uh, but this one right here kind of fails the test. Now, I live in North Carolina. This is the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse. I know it well, but it doesn't say North Carolina. It doesn't say Cape Hatteras. It doesn't say Outer Banks. It misses the mark. A good souvenir product has to rely on location first and then great graphics. See, this is kind of boring, but there's still a ton of it. Okay, This is the kind of stuff I like. I like really intense graphics. I do a lot of lighthouse work, too, as far as products, and that's why I really like that one. Okay, um, So you can see when you start talking about the souvenir marketplace, it has to be a different approach. Okay, And there's more to it than just that. Uh, let me give you an example. 
uh, my wife and I, with our business, we, we created a line of our own images that were appropriate to summer tourism along the east coast of the United States. Okay, we'll leave it that way. Mostly beaches, that type of thing, okay, along the Atlantic Ocean. And so we had a collection of designs. We could drop in different names of different beaches on there and sell them to different places. And they were really good designs, okay? But we had a hard time getting into some of the shops because usually we were too late. You know, we'd go talk to them in like March and whatever. They've already bought their merchandise. I didn't really understand that because, you know, summer's still a long way away. But I had a shop owner tell me how it works. I'm going to give it to you quick and straight and easy. Basically, she said that they go to these shows in the late fall and they look at merchandise. They're huge merchandise shows. They look at all the merchandise that they want to put in their store for an entire year. Now, for them, a year is really three months, okay? A little bit longer. But, you know, for a season, let's say a season. And they'll actually go home with all these quotes and everything, and they'll pick out what they want for their inventory, and then somewhere around the first of the year, they will place all their orders with all their vendors. Now, most of these vendors are doing very large volume, and they have certain volume requirements, but they'll do a delivery that's staggered because they realize a lot of these shops don't have enough storage space. So if they're making them by 4,000 mugs, they'll let them get uh, like roughly, what, um, 1,200 at a time or something to that effect, a little bit more than that. And they split it up into thirds, and typically you get third of the order right before Easter, because that's like the first tourist weekend along the East Coast. And then you get the second third right before Memorial Day, and you get the final third in late June prior to 4th of July. And you don't want any more after that, because you want to get rid of your inventory before Labor Day. So this is how they're buying the stuff, okay? So I'm like, wow, you you got to really buy a lot, you know? And they say, oh, yeah, and they have to go out and borrow money from a bank. You usually have a one-year loan and a huge paybacks, you know, for all their merchandise. So I started thinking about it. I said, you know, what's wrong with this picture? What's wrong with this picture is they're buying a lot of stuff they don't know if they can sell. You know, they don't know it's going to sell. And I asked that question. I said, how do you know what's going to sell and what's not? Well, you know, it's kind of trial and error. I said, so let me get this straight. If you get some stuff in and it doesn't sell, you're kind of stuck with that, yeah? And the stuff that sells really good, you need to replenish that. What kind of turnaround is there? Oh, there isn't any turnaround. So what do you mean? I said, well, we ordered for the whole year. You don't get replenishment. They don't do that. That's not how these companies are set up. So another light bulb went off. And I said, I'll tell you what, instead of buying 4,000 pieces from me, why don't you buy 48 pieces from me? And you can have some different designs, and you can experiment to see what sells, what people like. You're not stuck with a lot of inventory that you can't sell. You bought a small amount, and then you can replace it as you sell it. We can do that. Really? I said, yeah, it saves you on your bank loans and inventory costs. And well, that's kind of interesting. Let me see what kind of pricing we talk about. Now, then they went into sticker shock. Because they're used to buying 4,000 pieces, I'm selling 48. You know, we're not getting the same price. But my point to them was this. You get to test market products at a little bit higher per piece cost, okay, but with almost no risk. And then when you find what sells good, you can get in bigger quantities, okay, and I can give you a better price. But, you know, here's what my whole point of this is I found some of the weaknesses. And instead of me just trying to sell them a coffee mug with something on it, I found a way to kind of create a program for them, their test marketing program, where it was like a no-risk test market kind of thing. And, you know, it was slow to pick up with some of them because it's a different how they do it. But my point being is I found something that worked for them. Okay, that's where we're trying to go. You know, just had to throw that back up while we're talking about souvenirs. You know, earlier I showed you our rockets advertising, but here it is back to souvenirs. And there's that key. Again, they sell these things geared to tourism. Okay, and that tourism starts with we got to put Orlando in there. Then we have a great design. Then we stick our name on there. You know, and think about that. A lot of people think that Hard Rock is a hamburger restaurant. That, well, it's more than hamburgers, okay? But they think it's a uh, you know a restaurant that sells T-shirts. It's really a T-shirt shop that sells hamburgers. Okay, look at Harley Davidson. Harley Davidson now has stores where they don't have any motorcycles. They're just out selling their product. They're just selling their name. They're selling advertising all day long. I mean, that's pretty impressive, right? Okay, so let's take a look at this. What we have here is a license plate with an athletic theme. Actually, a school theme, and this could be school products. School products is a boring phrase. So we call it spirit products. See, when you put words into things to make them sound a little bit bigger than they are, a little bit more special, you raise a perceived value. A lot of opportunity in, in spirit products, but, you know, the schools are tough. I mean, there's not, not, lot of, not a lot of money in the schools. Uh, the key here is to find the booster organizations. Work with the booster organizations uh, because they do their own budgeting and go to in there and use keywords like fundraisers. Okay, I mean I was a booster president for three years. Uh, I, 
don't tell me about you know money, spending money. Tell me about how to make money. So when you start using fundraising words and then go present this as, hey, you can sell these products and make money. Um, you know, most of what we did, I was a band booster president for three years, was selling pre-made products, you know, at special events and in the cafeteria and whatever, and we can move a lot of stuff, okay? Uh, so we certainly were making money on it as well as the people producing the products that the band was selling. You know, athletic boosters, PTA, I mean, there's a lot of different ways you can go with that, uh, but spirit fundraisers, you know, can be huge. Now, another type of fundraiser that I like a lot is one at the elementary school. And this is where we do what we call kids' artwork. And the mug is one of the best representations there of where the kids draw a picture and then you're sublimating it onto something that the parents buy. And the parents will buy, okay? I mean, this is too important not to. I have that kind of stuff floating around and my oldest is like 25. So anyway, um, T-shirts you probably won't do a lot of because most of this is for the parents. So when you start thinking about product line, think about for the parents. I mean, because a T-shirt is going to get worn out. It's not a great long-lasting item. It's certainly a cool thing that a kid can draw something that can be put on a t-shirt that he can wear, but he's going to outgrow it, it's going to get washed, it's going to fall apart. The mug will last forever, you know, or maybe you're doing mouse pads, you're doing refrigerator magnets, you're doing iPhone covers. Um, there's just a lot of neat things we can do with this. And, you know, the key here is the kid draws it, uh, someone collects the artwork and the money, and they come to you with one single check for all the orders so you can do them all at once, okay? But, you know, fundraiser, man, it's a great fundraiser. All right, here's an example of a T-shirt with a deer on it. It's the Willow Lake Hunting Club. What is that all about? It's about making a statement. People like to make statements, okay? And they make statements by what they wear and what they do. Where I live here in North Carolina, deer hunting very popular. You get a picture of a deer on Bubba's shirt, he's going to be excited, okay? You can certainly go to clubs and make club T-shirts. You can make personalized things for people. Because a lot of these guys, when they shoot a deer, they take a picture, right? And then they, they, once they figure out they can put a picture on stuff, you know, you can make a lot of money with that. Um, so I've spent time at hunting clubs, but me really more fishing clubs because I'm more a fishing guy than I'm not really into hunting. Uh, but it's the same kind of thing is people have pictures, and then we can sublimate them on all kinds of stuff and create some pretty neat products. But definitely I do like approaching clubs because there's multiple people, which means multiple orders if you do it the right way. And a lot of times, you know, see, that to me is actually a little boring. It's, it looks like it's put together with clip art and, or L draw. Oh, yeah, it was. And, uh, you know, it's okay. I mean, you know, if they like, I really don't like the font there. But if you can get something that's more custom, sort of a slogan kind of thing, this really makes a statement. The other one said, I'm a hunter. This makes a statement. Hunting bucks and knocking back long necks. Now, you know, rednecks in the south, um, you know, it's all about beer and hunting. They don't hunt. They don't drink and hunt, okay? But it's, it's still that sort of, you know, persona that they carry on, you know. So, you know what, if I take that into the hunting club, I'm going to sell a lot more than if I go into the hunting club with that. Okay, I'll tell you that. You know, maybe we can put Willow Lake in a different uh, font style to try and make it look like, you know, what's on the back there. Um, that's what's going to work. Okay, it's about making a statement. That's why I've done a lot of cool things. We've got a lot of Marine bases around here, a lot of military bases, Marine Corps, uh, Camp Lejeune up the road, and uh, they all have to make statements, you know. We've done some pretty cool stuff with those guys. Okay, what is this? Well, it's, it looks like a puzzle. This is not actually a puzzle. Um, this is a set of coasters, okay? So this is actually a set of coasters rather than a true puzzle. <laughs> I'm from the south, and I resemble that remark. I like that. Um, so with that said, anyway, this is actually a coaster breaks apart. But what we really want to call this is not a coaster. We want to reference it as a personalized gift. Because when we use words like personalization, that again is taking us to a different level. Okay. By the way, I'm in Wilmington. So I got some people I got some North Carolina people on, you know, talking to me. So uh, sending me um, some text over here. But you know, when you go into the personalized gifts, you know, there's that phone cover again. But there's all kinds of neat stuff. You know, things with the baby, like you got the baby and you got the little footprints and all this text here on the mug. I mean, those are great things to sell to the family. You know, and a top dollar personalized, okay, raises that value. You know, here we can use some keywords like a memory. Okay, you don't describe that as a picture of the kid. This is a lifelong memory that you preserve forever. You know, on this particular product, a keepsake. 
you know, we just keep on raising the perceived value. You might even be able to get heirloom out of it if you set it up the right way. So anyway, uh, here's somebody from Washington State. It's okay. My brother is from Washington State. He's visiting. See? So, uh, you know, what can I say? All right. Um, here's a great example about perceived value and what it's worth. I mean, you know, he, I didn't do this. A friend of mine did this. But so a lady comes into the shop. Husband's written this thing about the newborn baby girl. Uh, and she said the husband you know, really doesn't have a lot of this sentimental type of value, but yet he writes this astounding piece that she wants to put it on something. So the friend of mine suggests that they sublimate it onto basically a wooden plaque. Um, and it does you know, some extra graphic work to make it like parchment paper and all that kind of stuff. So my friend, this is, a, this is the interesting part, my friend charged like $125 for this. I mean, unbelievable. The lady didn't bat an eye, you know, because it was that important to her. You know, I would have been scared to death to throw that out, but yet people do it and get away with it. It's amazing. Okay, Okay. final thing, what is this? This is an example of a great scam. No, that's an example of the proof that people will buy just about anything if it's packaged and promoted creatively. And the packaging I'm referring to is not the box. Okay, the Packaging I'm referring to is how did they describe it to other people? What words were used? I mean, think about the pet rock for those of you that remember it, okay? It was the ultimate pet. You didn't have to feed it. You didn't have to walk it. It never whined. It didn't tear up the furniture. It didn't have to go to the vet, okay? And when you got tired of it, you just threw it out in the yard. And that's green. See, you took the rock and you threw it back from the earth from whence it came. So the reality is it was promoted heavily when it was nothing but a rock, and yet people made millions of dollars off of it, okay? That's the kind of thing you think about. Everything that you sell, think of it as a, as a pet rock, okay? It's just a piece of something ordinary until you make it extraordinary, okay? So how you present it makes all the difference in the world. So at the end of the day, the question was, what are you selling? You're selling products that use decoration and embellishment to deliver a message and or enhance the value of the item being offered for sale, okay? So I got another real-life lesson. I'll be brief on this. Um, what you see here on the screen, this little tiny thing taught me so much. So I was in the water skiing world and uh, knew the owner of one of the world's largest water sports companies. That's how they build themselves, a company called Overton's. I knew Parker Overton. When Parker Overton was selling slalom water skis out of the meat department of the family grocery store. But anyway, his business got big, and I went to approach him in my early days about selling to them. And I was having a hard time getting through, so I called the top guy, you know. We weren't like great friends, but I knew the guy, you know. So he said, hey, I tell you what, Jimmy, um, be great to talk to you. And, you know, congratulations on starting a business. He said, but listen, I'm not the guy I talk to. He said, just because it's my company, he says, I have people hired to do all my buying. We have a whole buying department. They make the decisions. You know, I can get you an introduction, and my top guy, Greg, will meet with you. But I can't promise he's going to buy anything from you, especially just because you know me. So it was really up to you to be able to make that sell. He says, but I'll, I'll set up you know, a meeting. That was important. He got me a meeting. I went up to Greenville, North Carolina. For those of you in North Carolina, Greenville, okay? So I went up to Greenville, North Carolina, and I went in and met with Greg. Actually, I started with embroidery, so I, I threw my embroidery pitch. Hi, I'm Jimmy from uh, Cape Fear Embroidery Works. So I'm here to talk to you about uh, some of the great products we can do. You know, we can embroider the or Overton's logo on caps and jackets and shirts and bags and, you know, ski covers and da 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 da, -da you know, and, and the guy, his eyes just glazed over. And he cut me off. I didn't get very long, man. I mean, in a few seconds, and he said, wait a minute, is that it? Is that all you got? Embroidery. He says, I don't care about embroidery. I said, Really? I said, you got a catalog full of He says, no. He says, I don't buy embroidery, dude. He says, we got a catalog full of products, you know, and we sell those products. Our customers buy them. We make money. He said, you're not talking to me about products. You're talking to me about embroidery. I really don't care about embroidery. He says, to be honest with you, I probably get 50 calls a week from embroidery companies trying to sell me something. He said, um, I don't care. He said, that's not what it's all about. Let me tell you what it's all about. So he reaches around behind his desk, and he pulled this up. Okay, well, it was similar. Okay. He pulled up one of these, which is a drink koozie, if you want to call it a koozie. You know koozie is a brand name, right? Uh, anyway, a beverage insulator is the proper terminology. He, he pulls that out, and he shows it. It's just like this. It's a ski vest with a little strap. Straps work. Man, it's cool. Yeah, I loved it. And I was like, hey, I want one of those, you know? And he would say, Jimmy, we can sell a million of these. You know, We'll make a lot of money off these. Oh, by the way, look, we can you know, somebody can screen print the Overton's logo on there. He said, but it's not about screen printing. It's about a product that people want to buy, you know, and that's what they're in business of. And if you're not 
be able to show me some kind of product, then really there's nothing else to talk about. Thanks for coming by. See you later. It was, I mean, it was quick, man. It was quick. So, you know, I went in there thinking I was going to come out rich, and I came out poor. So, whatever. So, I went home, went out on the boat, went out on the lake. I'm skiing, kind of frustrated, thinking about it all, wearing my favorite hat. And suddenly, my hat blows off. Zoom, into the water. Spin the boat around, try to go back and find it. Water's a little dark. Hat disappeared. You know, hats don't really sink to the bottom. Okay, your average hat's made of cotton. It, it kind of semi-floats. But between the cotton being wet and the bill of the hat, which is made of cardboard on most hats, it makes the whole thing heavy, and it kind of sits down below the surface. It's hard to find unless you've got really clear water and you get back in a hurry. I couldn't find it, and I was a little frustrated. You know, it was my favorite hat, and I'm like, gosh, why don't they make a hat that floats? And then I got really quiet because the light bulb went off, and I said, I wonder if someone makes a hat that floats. Oh. So I started doing some research, found a company in Montana that um, – made hats out of all kinds of interesting materials. One of them was rip stop nylon. And they also, and this was really cool, this is cutting edge when they did it, they made the bill of the hat out of PVC plastic. And it still had a fabric coating, but it's PVC plastic. Now the reason they did it was because PVC will hold its shape. You can bend the hat and it holds its shape. Cardboard kind of wants to spring back a little bit. Um, but what they had, and I realized when I identified it, was they had a waterproof floating hat. So I got a sample, called up Greg and said, hey listen, dude, I got the incredible waterproof floating hat. He loved that, okay? Incredible waterproof floating hat. He said, I want to see a sample hat. So I went back, showed him a sample, and he bought 600 hats. Almost that easy, okay? Then we created a logo that went on the hats. It had the Overton's logo with a ski rope through the middle of it. But you know, the point being was he, he got me focused on that thing about you know, making sure that you deliver the product the right way, you package it the right way, you present it the right way based on the customer. And, you know, and that was the difference. I mean, I went in there just pitching decoration, pitching what I do, instead of talking to him about products that he needed and he could make money with, okay? So I learned a lot. And that's what I say, welcome to the real world. You learn a lot by making mistakes. Okay, in the real world, especially in the real world of sublimation or any digital decoration, a picture's worth a thousand words, okay? And you want to keep that in mind. Uh, so a lot of you are probably engravers. You're doing a lot of, you know, trophy work and those types of things. That's great because, you know, sublimation is an awesome compliment. It doesn't replace. It's a good compliment to engraving because one thing you can do is you can put pictures on things. It's kind of hard to do with engraving, okay? So the reality is being able to put pictures on stuff, a lot of people don't even think about that. They think about logos, okay, and names. But they don't think about pictures. When you put pictures on until you take it to a whole other level, okay, I'm going to show you. Right there you see on the screen is a white mouse pad. It's just like that phone cover we saw. It's kind of boring until we add something to it, okay? Now, this is a good promotional product. You could go and convince somebody to put their logo on it, okay? But you could do better than the logo. Check this out. I love this piece, okay? It's got a real picture on it, okay? This is um, a promotional product for Sally Ann's, which is a hamburger delivery kind of business, right? So they cook up the burgers, bring them to your house, kind of like well-known pizza companies, right? But they didn't just put their logo on there like a lot of people do. See, they put the cheeseburger on there. So if you're using the mouse pad and you're looking at the cheeseburger, uh, if you like cheeseburgers, it's going to make you hungry, okay? See, the picture got you excited. And, and the picture tells you everything, okay? Sally Ann's cheeseburgers, boom, you, you got that figured out, right? And then you looked over here and you can see the whole menu, you can see the pricing, you can see the phone number, the website, everything you need to do to order. That is a fantastic promotional piece that is a masterpiece and it has a picture. So you want to be creative, you want to find ways to put pictures in the thing over and over again, put pictures in the things because it takes the perceived value to a higher level. Okay, does a lot for it. So that's what I'm talking about, turning ordinary into extraordinary. Anything we can do with pictures. You know, again, if you're in the awards marketplace, um, you, you already know about action sports, you know, because people get awards and trophies and all that kind of stuff, right? But here we got an action sports photo, which you could sell. You can put that onto any type of, you know, photo panel, product, anything really, and you could sell that, okay? But if you really want to sell that, you take it to a little higher level. You get a more unique looking substrate. You put some graphics in there. You put a message in there. The one on the right costs about $2 more materials but sell for double the one on the left because it's a lot more exciting. It's, more, it's extraordinary. It's not just ordinary. Okay? Uh, somebody just added up about sublimation on metals like brass and stainless steel. You can only sublimate on metals if they have a polymer coating. 
Um, sublimation only bonds with polymers and polyesters. Now, when Sean comes back on in a little while, he can tell you about some of the metal products that JDS has. And JDS does carry metal products. They carry glass products. They carry acrylic products, wood products that are all been set up for sublimation. They already have some type of polymer coating on there. So there's certainly a lot of things out there. And, and Sean will talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. Okay. You know, here's another example. I mean, we got something that we could sell. Okay. This is a... Uh, on a, in this case, it's a hardboard type of product. Uh, and then we got something that's really cool here, okay? I mean, here we got Christina, we got the soccer, well, excuse me, the volleyball, the lightning bolts, you know, and, and the, the cost between these two is negligible. But the one on the right is going to sell for a lot more because it has a higher perceived value. It's an extraordinary product. You know, when you can compare, and I'm not knocking engraving in any way, please, don't think that I am, okay? Um, but when you look at you know engraving, you can capture a lot of basically one color type of things. When you do a photo award, now you're able, and that happens to be a wooden plaque on the right hand side. It's it's the equivalent type of material as what's on the left, but it's been sublimated. Okay, and here you got a picture of Eddie Lewis sliding into home plate. You got the Warriors logo. You got full color. I mean, you got a lot of things going on there. You captured the moment. That's the beauty of photography: is you capture a moment, you preserve it forever. You know, I live, you know, right here on the coast, and uh, yeah, just a few weeks ago we had a little minor hurricane. You know, a lot of people want to evacuate a hurricane. The surfers all, you know, drive to the beach in droves because they got big waves. But you know, knowing the surf culture, man, you go out there and take pictures of these dudes surfing, and uh, you can put them on to t-shirts, especially they're really into t-shirts, right? So I can take that photo there and I can merge it with the graphics, and now I can put like Hurricane Arthur down below because that's the one it was, Hurricane Arthur and a date or whatever, and sell it to the guy for 25 to 30 bucks and he won't blink an eye. I'll put it on a poly performance long sleeve mock turtleneck because those surfers like those because they use them for what they call rash guards. So when they're paddling on a surfboard with salt water, you know, it rubs against their arms. These are the only guys I know that will actually wear long sleeve t-shirts in the summer in the water. Okay, But anyway, it's just knowing the marketplace. Um, so... You know, and it's with artwork. I'm not an artist at all. And you got to be careful because people come and say, I need a baseball. We want to put some lettering on there. It's like, okay, that could be rather boring. Okay. Be familiar with some of these companies that do fantastic graphic images that you can buy online. Do not look for free clip art. Free clip art, usually the quality is not there. There's, it can be copyright issues. You want a legitimate company that basically sells you a license to use their artwork and then understand it because if you're doing that the right way then you can sell products all day long with their artwork on it and no one's going to come sue you. But anyway, you know, you got that boring baseball or you can do something like this, okay? By the way, the item on the right hand side is completely available to download, okay? The lettering, you know, we're going to add the lettering in as we need it for, you know, the application, but the baseball with the nuclear holocaust storm kind of thing growing there, man, that came from Great Dane Graphics, you know, so you go purchase it, download it, use it. Which one's more interesting? Which one's probably going to give you a higher margin and more repeat business? You know, same thing, we have the football, and then we have the killer football, okay? But it's the same kind of concept. You want to be as familiar with the different graphics companies and what they have to offer as possible so you can find cool, unique things to show the customer. Customers are usually thinking on the left because they don't know about the right. So you got to work, you know, to bring them the right. And no, Sean, this isn't a political conversation. But anyway, uh, we're just talking about the images on the screen. All right, and then you got to just dare to be different. I mean, anybody can sublimate a mug. Come on, well, if you have a mug press. Um, but, you know, what are some of the cool things out there? Let me tell you, JDS has a fantastic collection of unique products, and it pays for you to see what they have. Okay, you can visit online and see all the different products. Because then you start having the ideas that you can show to people, you know. I mean, the phone covers have just been absolute, you know, very big seller across you know the country and the tablet covers as well. Uh, the acrylics and, and JDS was one of the first to actually start doing sublimated acrylics. And these are really cool because you sublimate on the back so it, you're looking through and as you're looking through um, it looks three-dimensional, though it's not really, but it looks that way. There's some really cool products. Same with the glass. Glass is a little bit thinner, but the glass are very unique products as well. There, there goes some glass right there. So, again, you can get some really neat looks and, and with that. And that's different, and that's what you want to be different. I mean, a lot of – everybody has a wooden plaque, some a glass plaque. You know, something different to look at. Flip-flops one of my favorites. I mean, that's called formal wear where I live, but, you know. 
hey, it's unique and different, right? Tile, and Sean loves tile. Okay, let me tell you, he loves working with tile. Uh, this is a ceramic tile mural. It was the, the finish size is about six feet by eight feet, roughly. I went to the dentist office. So this is targeted to a high-end professional, right? So the dentist uh, commissioned it. Uh, it was a total cost in, in materials and labor of about $600, but the price tag was 6000 So, you know, keep that in mind, you know. Pet industry, never underestimate the pet industry. Uh, Americans spent, I think it was 2012, spent something like $225 million in Halloween costumes for their pets. There's a lot of money in the pet you know, world. Keep that in mind. <laughs> There's lots of neat products we can do for the pets. You know, look at this one. Uh, now, I do know JDS has sublimatable pillows, but this was actually done before anybody had a sublimatable pillow. In that case, somebody sublimated fabric went to a seamstress who made the pillow, and they sold it for 150 bucks. You know, and those two dogs probably lie on it all day long. And then finally, we have what I call thinking inside the box. A lot of people don't think about the memorial products or the funeral industry, but you know what? <laughs> There's opportunity there. Um, we won't get too deep into that, but the point being there is opportunity. But I'll tell you what you're looking at. These are called casket cap panels. That's called a casket cap right there. Now, initially, these were done on fabric, and uh, they would take a piece of cardboard, and it would be die cut to fit inside this opening. Now, keep in mind, different casket styles, models, whatever, different size openings. Okay, So, you know, we're talking about companies that, in many cases, the, the printing company, the sublimator, was doing this for a casket manufacturer, and the casket manufacturer gave them standard sizes or whatever. Okay, but you know, if you're going to actually do things like personalization, where you can really get some decent amount of money out of it, then you got to figure a way to deal with each casket one on one, kind of. Okay, but anyway, let me tell you how it's done. Then, then let me tell you about a, a newer version. Um, the original version was cardboard die cut to fit that opening. You printed on fabric, and the fabric was wrapped around the cardboard, taped on the back. Uh, with shipping tape, and then double-sided tape was added, and it was pushed in and inserted into that area there by like the funeral director. Okay, and retail on these panels 350 bucks. You know, in that range, if they're printed, if they're embroidered, it could be higher. So the reality was, this was the initial way of doing it, and and the reason that people were wrapping it around the insert, the cardboard to put it in, is that was the cardboard held it, you know, as a panel. And you wanted to wrap it around because it smoothed out the edges and then force fit it in the casket cap to further smooth out the edges. So it looked like it came custom, right? Um, but lately, and the other thing is you need a bigger printer and heat press too. Lately, the new trend is, is to take the Chromalux aluminum panels, or really any good quality aluminum panel. You take an aluminum panel designed for photography, and you can get these that you can print with like the Ricoh 7100 without any problem. Um, you get that and you sublimate it onto that metal panel. And the metal panel is going to be smaller than the opening, but a metal panel has really clean edges to it. Uh, and then you again, you put the double-sided tape and it <laughs> plugs right in. Okay, And then you can personalize the heck out of them. You know, you're talking about a metal panel. It might cost 13 bucks blank. And then you're going to put about a dollar's worth of sublimation on it. Uh, and then again, it's still got a high retail price. And it, one can be in the casket. One can be on the easel. You can sell whole packages to the family. JDS actually has uh, urns. Where you can sublimate, you know, these types of you know images of loved ones onto the urn. Um, there's just a lot of different ways you can do it. Memorial products, a lot of things going on there. Just just to throw that out there, because most people never thought about the market. So packaging it up, packaging and cross selling go hand in hand. Um, you know, you look at what's up here. Everything up here was sublimated in the lower half. Okay, that was embroidered. That was screen printed. If you're an embroiderer, that's all you could do. If a screen printer, that's all you could do. Yeah, and in sublimation, you can do all those things. But the whole point is to show people that they can package things together so you can sell more products. And just to show you a couple of packages here, I'm just going to go through, I'm not going to go into detail, but I want to really get Sean back in, talk about a few things here um, in just a second. Right here, this is like for a hotel. And you want to build packages for different markets. You don't build a package for every customer, it costs too much money. But you start talking about markets. If you want to go into a hotel, you think of everything you could do in the hotel. And you put that together in a package. I mean, you know what? All these things are sublimated. And you might not have thought about half of them. But you start thinking about everything that can go in every room. Are you going to sell to the Hilton? No. But you'll see, you can sell to some of the boutique hotels, bed and breakfast, things like that. Put together something visual to show people. Because they may be at a hotel college and all they wanted was, you know, the, um, a serving tray. 
<laughs> and you hit them with all these other things and pick up more of their business. That's what we're talking about. You know, here we have just some school products. Um, the idea is to expand that out to as many different things as you can. Create a fictitious high school so you don't step on any toes, you know. But build you a really nice kit that's got a lot of stuff in there. Uh, the wedding market. So many opportunities there. And you know, here we have a wedding kit because you're probably going to go to wedding planners and pitch them on selling your products for you. Okay, so they need something to see what's you know they're able to do. This was a soccer team in Europe, and you know a nice package kit again that could be used for any soccer team in Europe. Um, one of my favorites here. If you actually come to the JD next JDS seminar, which is um, in Boston, you'll probably see some of these. You know the hookers. Okay, it has to do with fishing tackle, but as you can see, this is a whole promotional product collection all geared at one particular client. And again, if you, the client calls you and says, hey, we want to get some promotional product mugs, you go in and show them all these kind of things. You know, Have some really good kits so that you can package and cross-sell the right way. All right, so let's sum it all up here on the keys to making money. And uh, they look kind of like this. All right, hit the right button. Don't focus on price, OK? Someone else always do it for less. If you give it away for free, someone will pay the customer to take it. Okay, that's kind of sad, but it's the truth. You know, you, you you're never the lowest. It never happens. Okay, and that's a bad way to be. Focus on being the best. It sounds very cliche, but being unique in your products and all those types of things. You know, great graphics, unique products, creative packaging, and go where the money is. Okay, find niches and go after those niches, and go where they lead you. Okay, one of my niches was saltwater fishing. Believe it or not. And we handled saltwater tackle shops from like Virginia Beach, Virginia, Daytona Beach, Florida, almost 30% of the East Coast, okay, because that's where the money was. So that's where you go, okay. So I tell people that. you got to leave your house sometimes, you know. you got to leave your neighborhood. Uh, go pursue it. You find a good market, pursue the market instead of trying to be a jack of all trades. That's where we're trying to go. And uh, so let me, Sean, if you want to come back in, let me add you. I don't have you on this last slide here. So let me get your email address in here in case people want to reach you as well. Sure. You have an email address. It's like uh, uh, Sean R. That's all right. It's S H O N R. Yep. At at jdsindustries.com. There we go. So that's my email. There's Sean's email. Sean, welcome back. Um, you know, somebody was asking some about metals, and if you want to talk about, and somebody else was asking about glass products too. Um, so, mm -hmm. I mean, a couple of those questions already out, out of the gate. If you want to touch on a little bit about some of those products, sure. Um, I assume that they're discussing sublimation metal, M-E-T-A-L. Um, yeah, yeah, M-E-T-A-L. Okay, and, and sublimation metal is one of our largest products that we sell. It's a customizable product. So typically we come to you as a 12 by 24 sheet, uh, would come in white, gold, or silver, and you can custom cut it um, with a, a metal shear. And a lot of people use it for uh, producing sublimation plates on plaques. That's probably one of the biggest uses of sublimation metal. Um, but you can also use it for trophy plates. Uh, and also, if you have a rotary engraver, you can also actually cut out uh, shapes uh, with that material and, uh, and customize it that way. Um, but yeah, the sublimation metal is used a lot in car show plates, uh, dash plates is what they typically call them. Um, yeah, and that, that's a, a very big item for us. Now, what about glass? I think you have some sublimatable glass. Yes, the King Coat glass. Um, that uh, was we acquired that just uh, maybe a couple of years ago, and uh, it comes in a lot of different sizes. It's basically a it's a presentation piece. It has it comes with a little pin on, it. and then you saw that earlier the slide that Jimmy showed with the uh, the piece. It's basically a stand up piece, easy to sublimate. Uh, you sublimate on the back, and also the the interesting thing about those king coat glass pieces is that the light can actually come through it. So uh, while you get it a very good image quality on that piece, you can also put it uh, somewhere where the light can shine through. It creates a nice effect, and it comes in uh, landscape and portrait sizes. Uh, five by sevens, four by sixes, six by eights. Okay, I was uh, trying to remember your website for your sublimation seminars. Yeah, I've see if that takes right me there. If you want it. <laughs> I'm going all over the place. Uh, why don't you give me that website real quick so we can show everybody? Sure, sure. Yeah, it's www.jdsindustries.com. 
slash sublimation, or excuse me, slash seminar. Okay. Okay, everybody take note. It was jdsindustries.com slash seminar, and that gets you to where you can find the information. You see Boston coming up August 7th and 8th. I know some people have been asking me about the Boston one. One of the questions is, will you actually be showing how to sublimate there in Boston? So if you want to elaborate a little bit about what's going on uh, in the upcoming seminar. Yeah, and what's nice about these uh, classes that we do is that whether you are just starting or whether you've been in sublimation for 10 years, uh, most people walk away with something that uh, they didn't know uh, that helps them improve their business, whether it's from the sales end side, the production side, or the graphic side. So we will go through in the first hour actually producing some of the items uh, that are a little trickier, a little bit different than our um, than the usual products. Um, but that might include flip-flops or it might include glass, tiles, uh, FRP, or what's usually called a unisub product. Um, so we'll still make those items and show you how to layer the press and some of the pitfalls and some of the techniques and the tricks. And then in the next hour, we'll do graphics. So we'll go in and do a show you Corel Draw techniques and, and possibly Photoshop techniques. And we'll answer questions about uh, how to produce things and how to color match. Uh, we break for lunch. Uh, then we go into supplementing apparel, which is another thing that people um, have trouble with because it's a little different product. It's a, it's a trickier product. So we show people how to supplement the apparel, how to market the apparel, uh, usually with uh, either uh, with a guest speaker uh, from Vapor, which is the product that we carry, or uh, Jimmy Alvin helps out with that too. And then we go into the last hour, which is the marketing part, uh, and Jimmy will be there presenting and showing people how to uh, market sublimation. And so we can go into a lot of details about how to market, how to find avenues of uh, revenue streams for that. Okay. Um, yeah, I get this one a lot. I don't have an answer. Maybe you do, Sean. Is there a way we can improve the UV resistance of sublimated items we wish to use outside? Yeah, I mean, generally speaking, sublimation is still an indoor use only uh, product, although there are some products uh, that are out there, like, uh, for instance, the, uh, the hitches. Um, uh, what do you want to call those? The bubble hitches? Yep. You can actually sublimate a plate and put it in place of where your typical uh, hitch hookup would be. Uh, and there's license plates, and there's things that are meant to be outdoors, uh, but mostly you just have to make sure you sell that with a disclaimer that this is you know, a product that's not going to last forever outdoors. Uh, there are some products we carry a UV submetal that has been tested to last about two years outdoors. Um, we actually tested that product. It's a metal metal product. But that's, uh, you know, that's the lifespan of what sublimation is currently. The, the technology continues to improve, and believe me, as it does, you will know about it. But it is typically an indoor product for the most part. You know, one of the things that uh, I I reference is that the fact that it's going to fade over time outdoors is at least something called recurring income. Um, it's not a bad thing that it fades because everything fades, uh, except engraving. Engraving doesn't fade, so they say, but everything yeah. else fades, right? So the key is communication with the customer. If you actually tell a customer, listen, you're probably going to get about two years out of this and you have to replace it. You know, now they have an understanding they're probably going to get two years out of it, right? So in two years, if they need to replace it, they're not grumbling because they're not surprised, they were told. And, and a, or an example I use is a, a client that had a police department that bought like 100 license plates for their cars, and they told them, I said, you probably get two years out of these plates, and, you know, depending on how much you're in the sunlight, they're going to fade, you're probably going to replace them. I'm like, okay. Because it turns out they replace their cars because they get faded and worn out, and their uniforms get faded, and you know, and everything else. So you know what? Every two years they get a new PO for a hundred pieces. So, you know, the reality is just like Sean says, not designed for outdoors at this time, but in those outdoor applications, it'll last for a while. We don't know how long because it depends on how intense the sunlight is. But as long as you're clear with the customer, it may actually lead to future sales. You know, if you turn it around the right way. <clears throat> okay. Um, can sublimation handle white? There is no white ink for sublimation. Okay, so uh, the way that we reproduce the color white for sublimation is we leave an area open and then we sublimate it onto a white substrate. So the majority of those blanks that you buy for sublimation have a white surface, 
and you leave the white area open or no color and then the surface supplement, you know, supplements that. If you, for example, if you needed to have a black mouse pad, you would not buy a black mouse pad. You would buy a white one, and you would sublimate in the graphics and the background color you want it to be all as one graphic together. But where it gets tricky is on apparel, because if, you're, if you get a black T-shirt and you want to sublimate on it, you're not going to be able to do it, okay, um, for two reasons. Number one, white doesn't work. Number two, sublimation is considered transparent. So background color affects the sublimation color. And the sublimation color all, must always be significantly darker in the background color. So there's really nothing darker than black. So if it's a black t-shirt, you're not going to work. You can sublimate it, you just can't see it. You know, so oh, anyway. <laughs> a couple of questions about companies that offer good graphics and clip art. The two that I deal with the most are Great Dane graphics just like the dog great dane great dane graphics.com and action illustrated action illustrated.com um, i don't know if you have some additional ones you deal with sean yeah, i do um, we we go through big stock photo okay uh, dot com and if you get a subscription which we have uh, just recently got a subscription you can actually get the cost to about 60 cents a photo and so you just download five images a day and um, they have some really nice uh, photos in there. We use that for a lot of our samples. Yeah, the ones, that, the two that I mentioned were graphics, not photos. I, I just mm -hmm. want to throw that in too, uh, because you definitely, you know, if you're looking for photos, you're looking at different companies, you know, than the ones that typically do graphics. Um, is there a sublimatable magnetic material like for car signs? Um, there, there was. Um, <laughs> It didn't. It didn't work real well. Uh, so we had to. We discontinued. We had it for a while. Um, the trouble with it was, it did not stick to the car real well uh, beyond 10 miles an hour, and uh, we had a little trouble with the uh, delaminating from the the, the the sublimatable part from the magnet. So um, it, it's possible it might be still out there somewhere. It may have cropped up as a new product. I haven't seen it, but uh, the one that we carried it just it was not that uh, not that great. Okay, um, I think that covers pretty much everything that came in. So I'm going to step on out and say thanks for having me in, Sean. And I look forward to Boston coming up here in uh, about two weeks and, and hope some of you maybe um, are there. So uh, with that said, Sean, uh, thanks for having me out, and I look forward to working with you again in the future in another webinar. Hey, thank you, Jimmy. And, yeah, please join us uh, next time uh, for the next webinar, whatever that is.